developing right now on Morning News Now, a shutdown showdown on Capitol Hill. This morning, America is inching toward what could be one of the biggest inter-party fights ever as House Republicans struggle with their own leader to pass a temporary spending bill. Think about what they're voting against. They're voting against even bringing the bill up to have a discussion about it. The idea that you vote against the rule to even bring it up, that makes sense to me. We'll have the latest developments, including a late-night closed-door meeting, plus the major sticking points and what is at stake. Also this morning, temporary relief for consumers after the Fed decided it won't raise interest rates, at least for now. We'll break down yesterday's highly anticipated announcement and what it means for you. Plus, mail order testing new developments in America's fight against COVID. The Biden administration is restarting its program and offering more free COVID tests delivered to your home. What you need to know as the number of cases goes up once again. And convenient or concerning, this morning a new tool renewing a debate over artificial intelligence will show you the newest technology by the creators of ChatGPT that turns complicated text into detailed images and we'll tell you the impact it could have as the fight about AI rages on. Exactly, especially with the election now just a Absolutely. year away. Good morning, good to have you with us. I'm Joe Fryer. And I'm Savannah Sellers. Thanks for being here on a Thursday. House Speaker Kevin McCarthy is still looking for a path forward this morning as a deadline to get a spending bill passed looms. Lawmakers have until September 30th to keep the government funded before money runs out. That's just nine days from now. There are serious questions about whether Congress is going to get the job done. Republicans can't get on the same page right now. Five conservatives imploded a procedural vote on a bill to fund the military, and GOP leadership was forced to sideline another vote on a short-term spending deal. Now, House Speaker McCarthy's job could be on the line. He's telling law makers to clear their calendars because he is prepared to stay in session over the weekend to crank out a viable spending agreement. And McCarthy says he's confident they will get the job done. It's not September 30th. The game is not over. So we continue to work through it. And uh, I've been at this place many times before and we're going to solve this problem. NBC News Capitol Hill correspondent Ali Vitale joins us now with the latest in all this. So, Ali, McCarthy sounds optimistic. He says the game is not over, but where do things really stand this morning? Any progress made? Look, what choice does he have but to sound optimistic at this point? Because he's trying to cajole his conference on board for a plan that even when they agree on something, and they do have to agree on something, the Senate is inevitably going to change it, and it's going to bring them right back to where they started with conservatives upset about too little spending cuts. And that's where they are right now. Two hour plus long meeting last night after seeing failures on the floor this week, McCarthy huddled with members of his conference, some of whom, like Matt Gates, say they're never going to vote for a continuing resolution ever at all, count them out. That's fine, as long as there's not more than five of them. Gates, for his part, says he can count to more than five. I've talked to other Republican members who think the number is less than that. It needs to be less than that because that's all that McCarthy can afford to lose. But last night coming out of that meeting, it appears that there's at least a new framework on the board that would allow them to pass a one-year continuing resolution at the cost of $1.47 trillion for funding. That's much lower than the Senate will ever accept. It might be enough for hardline conservatives. But here's how you know that talks are at least moving in somewhat of a progress direction. Some of those key conservatives, like Ralph Norman and Ken Buck, say that they may at some point be okay voting on that procedural rule for at least the defense spending bill. They had been against it to try to preserve their leverage. So that might at least be a sign that something's moving in the right direction, even though we're far from completely at a solution yet. Absolutely. Allie, love the festive decor behind you, by the way. But McCarthy said Republicans will try Thank again. Thank you so much. It's spooky season. Yeah, I know. I, I just woman after my own heart. Love it. Well, Republicans are going to try again to hold a procedural vote today on that defense appropriations bill. That's what tanked earlier this week. Does he have the votes to get it passed this time around? What's the latest in terms of getting people on his side? It seems like they do for the reason that I just talked about, where Ralph Norman is one of those key House Freedom Caucus members who has said that the reason that he's voting against leadership and against progress on this is because he wants to be able to see what the full top line spending numbers, the total amount of spending on each of these 12 appropriations bills is going to be. He wants that full landscape. I'm not quite sure he's got it yet solely because I don't think they know what those numbers are yet because they haven't even agreed on the full total for what those 12 
12 are going to be di divided into. If they can't do the top line number, then they certainly can't do the full 12 spending appropriations number. But nevertheless, it's a sign that for Norman and for Ken Buck, who was just sort of backing him up on that defense spending bill, that at least they're seeing something that makes them feel they're not giving mm -hmm. back their leverage while also still getting what they want. And Allie, also across Capitol Hill, the Senate confirmed its first military nominee in months. That's despite those holds from Senator Tuberville. Yeah. How did Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer make it happen? Look, he made it happen by doing the thing that he said he wasn't going to do, which was voting on these nominees in smaller batches. In this case, voting on three specific nominations for the Joint Chief and the heads of the Army and Marine Corps. Those were nominations, at least for the Marine Corps, that Tuberville was preparing to put forward himself. He was going to try to use some procedural sleight of hand that gave him a dozen or so Republicans, giving him the ability to sort of shove this on the floor in the face of leadership. Schumer, of course, got wind of that and said, not -uh, on, not on my floor, effectively, and brought on a, a few more of those names, including CQ Brown, a nominee for Joint Chief that Tuberville himself opposed, but we did see movement on that last night. Here's the thing on this. Tuberville, and we were always wondering this, how he was going to find an off-ramp to this blockade that he had put on military promotions because of the VA policy to support people in the military with travel funding and logistical funding if they wanted to seek abortion care in a state where that wasn't readily available to them. Tuberville is still opposed to that. He says he hasn't changed his stance. He's calling this a win. Schumer, of course, is calling this a win because it allowed some of these key positions to now be filled, or at least be on the path to being filled. But here's the concern. These were never done tiny batch by tiny batch. If they were to even do them singularly, it would take hundreds of hours of precious Senate procedural floor time that, frankly, they just don't have. So by Schumer opening this window a little, there is concern from Democrats and Republicans that now they've set the precedent, they've shown they're willing to do it, but really yesterday was a game of procedural one-upsmanship in the Senate. All right, Ali Vitale. Ali, thank you. Well, Attorney General Merrick Garland is out of the hot seat this morning after spending several hours testifying before the House Judiciary Committee about his leadership of the Justice Department. Republicans accuse Garland of weaponizing the agency through his handling of several major investigations. But the Attorney General pushed back using his strongest language actually to date. NBC News Capitol Hill correspondent Ryan Nobles has the details. Attorney General Merrick Garland firing back at Republicans accusing him of weaponizing the Justice Department. I am not the president's lawyer. I will add, I am not Congress's prosecutor. The Justice Department works for the American people. But Republican lawmakers grilling Garland over what they call a two-tier justice system. There's one investigation protecting President Biden. There's another one attacking President Trump. Justice Department's got both sides of the equation covered. The GOP zeroing in on the special counsel investigation of Hunter Biden, alleging Garland was misleading when he said there was no interference in the investigation into the president's son. Garland was pressed if he had any conversations with special counsel David Weiss regarding the case. And I do not intend to discuss the internal Justice Department uh, deliberations, whether or not I had them. So your, your testimony today is you're not going to tell us whether you've had discussions with Mr. Weiss. My testimony today is I told the committee that I would not interfere. Two IRS whistleblowers have testified under oath that the DOJ gave preferential treatment to the president's son and that Weiss told multiple people he was not in charge. He wanted to bring an action in the District of Columbia, and the U.S. attorney there said, no, you can't. And then you go tell the United States Senate under oath that he has complete authority. No one had the authority to turn him down. Weiss has denied the whistleblower's accounts. Democrats calling the hearing a political stunt. This is a gross misuse of your time, your team's time, and our time. It is a shameful circus. With Garland slamming GOP criticism. Singling out individual career public servants who are just doing their jobs is dangerous, particularly at a time of increased threats. Again, that was our Ryan Nobles reporting there. Thank you to him. Here in New York, President Biden sat down with Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. It's the first time that's happened since Netanyahu returned to power. The meeting comes amid tensions between the two leaders over Netanyahu's controversial judicial overhaul plan. And the day after President Biden talked about Israel while speaking to the U.N. General Assembly. NBC News senior White House correspondent Gabe Gutierrez has the details. Joan Savannah, good morning. That's right. 
President Biden meeting with Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu at the U.N. General Assembly yesterday. It was not the more prestigious White House meeting that Netanyahu had been wanting, but the Biden administration has opposed the prime minister's judicial overhauls in Israel. And President Biden did invite him, though, to the White House by the end of the year. On the agenda, though, was a potentially historic agreement in normalizing diplomatic relations between Israel and Saudi Arabia. Netanyahu seemed open to that idea, but it would likely require concessions by Israel regarding the Palestinians. Still, Netanyahu said that it was possible moving forward for Israel to work out some sort of an agreement with the United States acting as a broker. Meanwhile, a big day here in Washington as Ukrainian President Zelensky is expected to come here to Capitol Hill, the Pentagon, and the White House. According to a senior administration official, the Biden uh, administration is expected to announce more security aid for Ukraine as part of a previously passed package. But the big sticking point might be when Zelensky heads to Capitol Hill to meet with lawmakers. The Biden administration is asking for $24 billion in additional aid. And just this morning, the Wall Street Journal is reporting a Republican letter from members of Congress to the White House rejecting that proposal. There's growing skepticism among Republicans for giving a what they call a blank check to Ukraine in, uh, in its fight against Russia. Uh, meanwhile, Zelensky also asking for long-range guided missiles, and a senior administration official says that no decision has yet been made on that specific point. But again, for the first time, Volodymyr Zelensky is expected to visit the Pentagon today, as well as Capitol Hill and the White House, where the president is expected to announce a security aid package, though the details remain unclear. Joan Savannah, back to you. All right, Gabe Gutierrez, thank you. Well, for just the second time in the past year and a half, the Federal Reserve paused interest rate hikes on Wednesday. Discussing the move, the central bank's bank said that the economy is in a, quote, solid state. For more, let's bring in Jennifer Streak. She is the senior personal finance reporter and spokesperson for the personal finance vertical at Business Insider. Jennifer, good morning. Good to have you. So even though we saw inflation rise a bit in July and August, the Fed's decision, not really a surprise. So why another pause? Well, I think that because job growth has slowed, but it's still solid and the economy is still solid, I think the Fed is happy right now with just trying to see what the 11 previous rate hikes are going to do over the short term. I think that they feel like it's actually having an impact a little bit. Inflation is starting to ease. So I think they just want to see where we're headed before they decide whether or not they're going to do another rate hike. So, Jennifer, what's this mean for viewers at home? I mean, it sounds like good, good news. Is this good for their money? Is there going to be relief from high prices we've been seeing? Well, it's not going to be immediate. We're still seeing high prices. We're still seeing high interest rates. So I think for consumers, they're still paying high at the grocery store and the gas tank. So we're still in, in, in the effect of having higher interest rates. So they're not, it's not going to be an immediate impact. Let's look ahead to the next big meeting. That's October 31st, Halloween. Could we see more interest rate hikes then or somewhere down the road? What's your read on the Fed's next yeah. move? And then what could we see moving forward after that? I think that they're definitely open to another rate hike. It is not off the table. So before the end of the year, we could see another hike and maybe even more down the road if inflation doesn't really come down to where they want it, where their target is quick enough. All right, Jennifer Streaks, helping our viewers understand what this means for them. Thank you very much. Thank the you. end could be in sight for the Hollywood writers' strike. CNBC is reporting that writers and producers are near an agreement after meeting face-to-face -face on Wednesday. They're citing people close to those negotiations. The Writers Guild of America and Hollywood Studios, including our parent company, NBC Universal, are set to meet again today and hope to finalize a deal to resolve the nearly five-month standoff. If they don't succeed, some sources say the strike could last through the end of the year. Reminder, the writers' strike is separate from the actor's strike. Now let's get a check at some stormy weather heading for the plains. That's right, Angie Lastman is here with us this morning. Hi, Angie, good morning. Hi there, guys, good morning. We are rolling right through this work week and we've got another day, really an afternoon and evening of some strong storms that are possible across the middle of the country. This morning, we're dealing with a couple of showers across parts of the plains, some heavy rain associated with that, headed a little farther to the east, just north of Omaha. We've got some showers across parts of Illinois, stretching down into Kentucky and Tennessee, but it's places like North Platte and in, in parts of uh, Oklahoma 
Oklahoma and Texas that are going to see those those stronger storms developing as we get into the afternoon hours. We kind of have a frontal boundary that's going to move through, bring potentially some heavy rain to parts of this area, but also those stronger storms that will accompany uh, that will be accompanied by maybe some large hail up to two inches in size. So we're talking softball size, as well as those wind gusts up to 60 miles per hour. We can't rule out the isolated tornadoes across these regions as well. So just a heads up, this is going to go not just the afternoon, but again, into the evening hours as well. When it comes to the rainfall amounts, same spots are going to see those elevated numbers. So maybe an inch to two inches in some of the higher amounts, but a widespread area across this region going to see maybe a half an inch or so. So some good soaking rain for our lawns here across that area. And talk about good soaking rain. This is the spot that we're going to watch here over the coming days. An area of low pressure likely to form, maybe that has some subtropical characteristics here as we get into the next day or so. But either way, it's going to usher in a whole lot of moisture for parts of the Carolinas. You can see how heavy this rain is. And it's not just the rain that we're going to be concerned with. We also have that potential for some really gusty winds, some high surf, some rip current risks across not just the Carolinas, but up through the mid-Atlantic and into the northeast in New England here as we get into, unfortunately, our Saturday and our Sunday. We're going to see this kind of unsettled weather stick with us for an extended period across parts of the East Coast. Localized amounts are going to be the highest in the coastal Carolinas, maybe upwards of five to six inches. We'll see some higher amounts in parts of the mid-Atlantic, one to two inches, but higher than that, maybe uh, isolated spots that could reach up to three inches. And there's those wind gusts that I promised, 30, 40, even close to 50 mile per hour wind gusts are possible. These are peak wind gusts that you're seeing through Saturday night. Notice places like Nantucket, close to 40 mile per hour winds, Ocean City, 47 mile per hour winds. So some really gusty conditions, maybe some down trees, down power lines as we get through the next couple of days. So something to watch across that region. Otherwise, look out west, great conditions, sunny and dry for your Friday forecast. Those stronger storms will sit across parts of the middle of the country as a system works, works across that area. Plenty of sunshine for parts of the Midwest on Friday. But again, the unsettled weather and the flood risk is going to be there for the Northeast and, and the middle of the country here as we get into your Saturday plans. Notice Texas, though, mm. still into the 90s, guys. They really haven't had much of a break. And even parts of the Midwest and the plains are going to remain elevated for temperatures uh, across uh, that same region, not just Saturday, but Sunday, too. Gorgeous. Savannah, this is for you. Autumn beauty out west. <laughs> if you're looking for the 70s and a whole lot of sunshine, you just got to go out towards the Rockies. It's going to be a great day on Sunday, but we'll still be dealing with some soggy conditions across the Northeast, unfortunately, as we round out our weekend. Already thinking of the movies and TV shows I want to watch this weekend. That is exactly oh, what yeah. I said. I've been yeah. making my plans as well. If you have any good recommendations, let me know. Look at you. You're an autumn beauty. <laughs> oh, <thank you. laughs> Fall vibe. I love it. As are you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, too, Jim. Thank Don't you. worry. Thank you. Autumn left beauty. out there for a second. <laughs> Much more coming up on Morning News Now. Later this hour, a new battle in the war against COVID cases back on the rise, but more free tests headed to the mailbox. What you need to know to keep your family healthy. First, though, after the break on trial, new developments from court in the case of two officers charged with the death of Elijah McClain. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Welcome back. The trial is now underway for two Colorado police officers charged in the death of Elijah McClain. That's right. Aurora police officer Randy Rodema and a former officer Jason Rosenblatt appeared in a suburban Denver courtroom yesterday. The pair are charged in McClain's 2019 death after the 23-year-old was placed in a chokehold by police and injected with a powerful sedative by paramedics. Both officers have pleaded not guilty. McLean's death mark sparked, excuse me, months of protests demanding justice and police reform. For more, we are joined by NBC News legal analyst Danny Savalos, of course, on this. He's here in studio with us. Hi, Danny. Great to see you. Good morning. So the Colorado Attorney General, they've charged two police officers, a former officer and two paramedics, one count each of manslaughter, criminally negligent homicide, as well as other charges. Walk us through what it is that's happening right now. I understand that the cases are no longer tied together. Why are they being separated? Tell us the latest. Uh, they are separated. The officers are being tried separately from the EMTs who responded to the call. And that's probably a major defense tactical victory for the officers, because even though the officers, by my view, made a lot of bad decisions, this seems to have been a bad initial stop based on nothing close to pro uh, probable cause. 
Uh, ultimately, it was the EMTs who allegedly arrived on the scene, allegedly misdiagnosed the, um, the arrestee, allegedly misestimated his weight, and then injected him with too much ketamine that caused death. So the police officers, while their initial stop was not a good one, uh, they at least have an argument in causation. In other words, they may have made a bad stop, they may have applied a carotid hold, which has been uh, condemned by the DOJ, but ultimately their argument's going to be that we were not the cause in fact of death in this instance. That was the EMTs. They're going to point it at the finger at the EMTs. That's why this separate trial is probably going to benefit the officers, probably not so good for the EMTs. Once again, we have a case where race and policing is front and center. How big of a deal will the racial makeup of the jury be in the selection process here? It's always critical. It's something that we don't talk about very much, but jury pools are everything. Uh, and we talk about different, you know, for example, you can just look at the demographics for a particular county and get an idea of what the racial makeup of your jury pool will be. But at the same time, uh, there is what we call Batson and reverse Batson charges. So one of the things we cannot do as attorneys is use our peremptory challenges to load a jury with people of one race or the other, whether that be the prosecutor seeking to get white people on the jury or the defense seeking to get black people on the jury. In my opinion, I've never looked at race. I think you can get a better view of an individual juror by talking to them in court and getting a feel for them because everybody's an individual. But yet there are still the bats and challenges. And if the other side thinks you're trying to load the jury mm -hmm. and use your challenges to get rid of one race, they can stop it. As this unfolds, what will you be watching out for? I'll be watching this trial to see the evidence of causation that the officers put up. Uh, it is uh, alleged that at least the EMTs came to the officers and said, hey, should we supposedly give this guy ketamine? That could link the officers and the EMTs' actions. But if I'm the defense for the officers, the entire thrust of this case is this is a tragedy, but it was those people, the EMTs, that we trusted, and they breached our trust uh, in injecting this person with far too much ketamine. All right, we'll see what happens. Danny Zavalos, thank you so much. Yes, thanks as always, Danny. Well, let's get you some international headlines now, starting with rising tensions and protests in Armenia. NBC News foreign correspondent Kelly Kobiea joins us now with more. Kelly, good morning. Good morning, Joe and Savannah. Yeah, thousands took to the streets in Armenia overnight, clashing with police, some of them, over the government's handling of the crisis in Nagorno-Karabakh. That area is internationally recognized as part of Azerbaijan, but Armenian separatists had been in control for three decades. That is up until yesterday when they said they'll surrender to Azerbaijan. Many Armenians are now blaming their government for not protecting those separatists. Mexican singer-songwriter Peso Pluma has now canceled his concert in Tijuana next month because of security concerns. It comes after Pluma was apparently threatened by a drug cartel. Pluma posted a statement on Instagram saying that our objective is to protect the fans and our team. And seven drawings by famous Austrian artist Egon Schiele have been returned to their former owner's heirs after more than 70 years. The Nazis stole the entire art collection of Austrian Jewish cabaret performer Fritz Grunbaum. Both he and his wife Elizabeth were killed in Nazi concentration camps. The Manhattan District Attorney said that museums and collectors voluntarily turned over that artwork after the DA's office proved the works had been stolen. And one of the heirs says that at least some of those works will now be auctioned off to fund a scholarship for young musicians. Wow. Guys. That oh. is great to see. All right, yeah. Kelly, thank you so much for bringing us that story. Thanks. Coming up, controversy in a Texas classroom over the suspension of a black student. We're not backing down at all. We're going to fight. Coming up, the growing calls to end a school district policy on hairstyles. Plus, tests in the mail. The Biden administration is restarting its COVID testing program as the number of cases goes up. What you need to know next on Morning News Now. We're back with a look at the Biden administration's plan to relaunch a program that provides free COVID tests to American households. The White House announced yesterday that they will be providing $600 million in funding to produce new at-home tests. Starting Monday, September 25th, Americans will be able to request four of those free tests 
per household through covidtest.gov. Let's bring in NBC News medical contributor, Dr. Natalie Azar, for more on this. So the announcement comes as we're seeing this rise in COVID mm -hmm, cases. Yeah. So how important is it to have this new supply of at-home tests? Could it help us in any way? I mean, yes, and I think, did we all get a little bit complacent, right? For you know, sure. we had, but we had a nice lull. Cases were going down, but mm -hmm. cases are going up. And I think we have to remind ourselves that testing to either determine whether or not you are infected after exposure or if you're symptomatic, knowing when you're contagious, you got to dust off these tests. And I think one of the biggest things that people said, well, how do I know if my test is still good? You look at the expiration date. Mm -hmm. You're not sure. Can you use it after the expiration date? It's not advised, but you can go to FDA.gov, the FDA website, look up the lot number and see if they've extended the expiration date oh. on a lot of your at-home tests that you might still have in your medicine cabinet. That's a great tip. So yeah. are are we in for a winter surge? I mean, do we need to be super concerned? I think that we are always in for a winter surge, right? I mean, winter, fall, and heading into winter is the time when these respiratory viruses flourish. So I think we can all have every expectation that we're going to see RSV, we're going to see flu, and we're going to see COVID again. Um, you know, cases that wastewater data recently has gone down a little bit. Oh. Remember, wastewater is always a couple of weeks ahead of what we see clinically because it is a predictor. So hopefully we're seeing hmm. this like kind of... <laughs> I think it's because... Everyone's had COVID. Yeah, in the last that, month. well, that's I mean, true. That, yeah. That's true too, it right? It feels like it, right? Right. But I think I think most of us are thinking that perhaps this late summer surge is going to be coming down a little bit. Maybe we haven't. We're at a getting to a peak, but then imagine in the middle of the of the winter when everyone's inside Oof. and everything, we're going to see it again. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You mentioned dusting off the old test, which yes. I think people have been doing over the last yeah. few. So if it's expired, you should not use it at all. So here's what I would say to people: if if you have no other test but an expired test and you're symptomatic, go ahead and use it. If it's positive, okay. it's it's very likely accurate. Yeah. If it's negative, do not assume that you're negative. Okay. Um, but yes, you mm -hmm. should go to the FDA website and look, and you can find out if they've extended the, those expiration dates. The one thing, the the um, the new test that you'll be able to get starting September 25th from the government, covidtests.org or covidtest.gov, um, they're actually set to expire by the end of 2023. So oh, the government, wow. yeah, they're, they're, they're to they're be used. Clearing them out. Through, yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> but good, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah, you're, get, you know, you're probably there. right. They yeah. probably looked and said, you know, we have a lot of these tests that haven't been used yet. Let's ship them out to folks hmm. because they, they're not going to be good forever. So just be aware of that when you get your test too to look at the expiration date on those. All right. All right. Dr. Natalie Azar, thank you so much. I'm going to say it in unison. <laughs> <laughs> well, turning now to an ongoing story out of Texas where a Houston area high school is suspending a black student for the second time this year because of his hairstyle. And now the family is calling on the district to change its policy. NBC News correspondent Antonia Hilton has the details. For years now, organizers have been pushing for the passage of something called the Crown Act, a piece of legislation that seeks to protect people from discrimination related to their hair, their hair styles, their hair texture in school or in the workplace. And 23 states have done just that. But now the case of a 17 year old in Texas is bringing this debate back into the forefront. Daryl George, a high school junior, has been out of class for more than two weeks. The Barbers Hill Independent School District in Texas has suspended him twice since the start of the school year over his hairstyle. His grades are, are failing, like they're going down drastically. He's not getting a proper education. All Daryl wants is the chance to join the rest of his classmates. Go back to class, do what I need to do to get my education. The district says his hairstyle, called locks, violates their grooming code, which states that male students' hair will not extend at any time below the eyebrows or below the earlobes. But Daryl's mom says her son always wears his hair like this, pulled back above his ears and eyebrows. Now the family is considering legal action. I want them to really educate themselves on our cultures, on our, on our hairstyles. And then they will see it is covered. It is a part of who we are. It all happened the same week the Crown Act went into effect in Texas, banning acts of discrimination against certain hairstyles and textures in schools and workplaces. 22 other states have passed similar bills, the legislation gaining momentum after incidents like the 2018 scandal over a black wrestler forced to cut his hair to compete. The school says this is really about the length of his hair. It's not about race. Do you see that distinction? 
we're dealing with the policing of a hairstyle like locks, brace, and twists that African descendants historically and commonly wear and are associated with our racial and cultural identities. It is a form of racial discrimination. The district filed a lawsuit seeking court clarification on the Crown Act. They maintain they're not in violation of the new law, which they argue doesn't govern hair length. Meanwhile, Daryl has no plans to change his hair. I'm saying straight to Barbara's Hill. We're not backing down at all. We're going to fight. We spoke with the family and they tell us that Daryl has been coming home in tears every day after school and that he's eager to just get back to class with his friends and to start learning again. His mother recently suffered a seizure and she told me that she thinks it's because of all the stress this mm. case has brought her. Back to you. All right, Antonia, thank you so much. Well, coming up, dramatic developments in the case of an author accused of killing her husband and then writing a children's book on grief. The letter a prison guard found in her cell that she says is fiction. Plus, some say it's new and improved. Others say it's cause for concern. We're going to show you the new technology by the creators of ChatGPT that's raising some eyebrows this morning. You're watching Morning News Now. We are back with a new development in the case of the Utah children's book author accused of fatally poisoning her husband. A prison guard found a seemingly incriminating letter in her cell, which she insists is a work of fiction. NBC News correspondent Aaron McLaughlin has the details. Hey there. While the prosecution claims that handwritten letter contained instructions for her family and friends and was an attempt at witness tampering, Corey Richens now says that detailed note was for a fictional story about her time in a Mexican prison. This morning, the woman known for writing a children's book on grief. My husband passed away unexpectedly last year. Now accused of spinning a very different tale. Corey Richens, the mother of three accused of killing her husband Eric with a lethal dose of fentanyl, says this jailhouse letter is actually an excerpt from a fictional mystery book she's been writing in prison. That according to the latest documents filed by the prosecution. The drama began on September 14th after guards found a six-page handwritten letter inside Richens' jail cell in which prosecutors allege Richens attempts to direct her family to spin a false narrative about her husband's drug use, telling them, bring me home. The DA calling the letter evidence of witness tampering. This morning, the prosecution doubling down on that allegation and raising even more questions. Its latest filing includes a partial transcript of a jailhouse phone call between Richens and her mom, Lisa Darden, where they say Richens tries to explain the letter. According to the filing, Richens telling her mother, when I first got in here, I was telling you how I was writing a book. Those papers were not a letter to you guys. They were part of my freaking book. Adding that in the fictional story, I go to Mexico and I'm like trying to find these drugs. Defendants who are incarcerated and know their calls are being recorded try to help their case by spinning part of the narrative. Complicating the narrative, in an interview with the Daily Mail, Richen's mom seemingly echoed talking points also found in the letter, saying, I know two occasions Eric bought drugs in another country and put the stuff in Corey's bag. Although it's unclear whether her mother ever saw the letter or some other version. The defense is arguing that the letter qualifies as attorney-client privilege and that its disclosure violates the gag order. But prosecutors are pointing to the jailhouse phone call with Corey and her mom to counter that argument. NBC News reached out to Richen's attorney for comment as well as her mom, Lisa Darden, but have yet to hear back. Aaron, thank you. And Dateline will have an in-depth report on this story with Andrea Canning airing tomorrow night at 10 p.m. Eastern. Now let's get you some financial headlines. The auto workers picket line is facing another hurdle, layoffs. CNBC Savannah Hanau joins us with that and other money news. Savannah, good morning. Joe Savannah, good morning. Yes, yeah, so General Motors and Stellantis announced new layoffs as the United Auto Workers strike against the big three Detroit automakers hits the one-week mark. GM idled a Kansas plant and laid off 2,000 workers, while Jeep maker Stellantis laid off about 370 workers at three parts factories. Stellantis did give the union a new contract proposal Wednesday, but a spokesperson said it primarily dealt with non-economic issues, and it's not clear whether it will satisfy the, quote, serious progress the UAW president demanded in order to avoid expanded strikes starting on Friday. 
Meanwhile, food giant Kraft Heinz is recalling more than 83,000 cases of individually wrapped Kraft Singles American cheese after six people reported choking or gagging on them. The company said they discovered that one of the wrapping machines allowed thin strips of plastic film to remain on the cheese slices even after the wrapper is removed. The recall impacts the 16-ounce and 3-pound multi-packs of the Kraft Singles American Cheese with expiration dates in January 2024. The federal agency in charge of regulating the safety of our products is trying to get their message out in a new way. The Consumer Product Safety Commission just dropped an album. The seven-track EP hopes to reach young people and include songs about the importance of wearing a helmet in electronic dance music style, as well as a reggae song about smoke alarms. You can listen to the whole thing on YouTube right now, guys. It's like an updated version of Schoolhouse Rock. All right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I think I'm at a loss for words between that and the cheese. <laughs> the cheese, we're, we're, right? a, little, know, we're like, a little horrified wow, by the cheese. Wow, that was but... a lot of news. <laughs> yeah, it, it was, it was, right. guys, it was. Okay. Just digest that a little. <laughs> Thank you. You got it. Open AI is once again making headlines, this time for a tool that can turn text into images. The artificial intelligence company released the latest version of DALI 3, which is used to create images with just a couple of prompts. According to a company statement, the system can, quote, translate nuanced requests into extremely detailed and accurate images. Let's bring in Sinead Bovell for more on this. She's a futurist and founder of Way. That's a company that looks to educate young entrepreneurs about the intersection of business and technology. Sinead, good morning. Thanks for joining us on this. So walk us through exactly what this means for somebody who maybe doesn't use chat GPT as it is. Like, what does this add here to make images? And how does this widen the pool for who might want to start using this technology? Right. So, so, and you pointed out to the main point of it being integrated with ChatGPT. So historically, to get these image generators to generate a piece of art or an image for you, you had to craft very this artistic science uh, to what's called prompt engineering, stringing together the right amount of words to really get the image generator to, to generate the detailed image. Now that it's embedded into ChatGPT, you can essentially engage in a brainstorming style conversation with ChatGPT. GPT, and ChatGPT itself will refine and generate the prompt for you. So this means it's a lot easier to go from ideation to detailed imagery. You no longer have to be an expert in what's called prompt engineering, which widens the pool to who gets to create art and images. So like anything related to AI, there are some major concerns mm -hmm. here, especially the possibility of spreading misinformation by making up images that aren't really yeah. real, especially with the presidential election next year. How big are these worries? So with the with the launch of Dolly 3, which will go live in, in October, these worries just increase that the, the quality of imagery it can generate, including other image generators, but especially now Dolly 3, is incredibly realistic. It can understand context and nuance. And now that it's embedded, say, right into ChatGPT, somebody could generate an entire disinformation campaign with text and imagery all in one shot. So misinformation, disinformation got a whole lot easier, got a whole lot more effective uh, and better quality, unfortunately. And there aren't really many guardrails around this. The companies themselves are deploying guardrails, but they're not legally enforceable. Let's talk about regulation. Obviously, there's been some conversations on Capitol Hill about this, but really nothing to come out of it, no resolution. Does this change that at all? I mean, does this make this more of a concern, more urgent? What should people know about if any safeguards are going to come into play eventually? I hope that this makes it more urgent. Uh, the easier it gets for people to generate any sort of content, uh, the more concerned we should be on terms of the, the risks of that, of that technology. We are seeing Congress and Washington start to mobilize around AI regula regulation, but they aren't, they're, they're hesitant to actually instill uh, any regulation. It's still very much in the ideation phase. But these models aren't going to wait. These companies aren't going to wait. So I encourage regulators to really lean in and get going here, especially with a, an election just around the corner. Mm. If, if you question an image, is there anything you can do? Like if you put it in Google Images, could that be the answer? Or are we kind of stuck Let's right say, now? say, yeah. Uh, and what do you mean by question the image? Yeah, yeah I'm looking at the image. Oh, I'm like, I don't know if this is real or if this was produced by AI. Is there, is there mm -hmm. a way to get that answer quickly or no? So if there are some AI detecting tools, I wouldn't count on them. Um, companies such as Google are actually deploying water 
are marking tools in their AI generated imagery. So if you do generate something, you could put it was you could put that it was it was AI generated, but that's again optional. Right. Uh, and that's about it. So it's really companies doing it themselves. All right, Sinead Bovell, really interesting. Obviously, a conversation we're going to continue having. Thanks for joining us. Coming up, climate catastrophe, fires, storms, heat waves, shutting down popular tourist spots overseas. Up next, the new warning from the UN and the global call for action before it's too late. This is Morning News Now. Welcome back. A piece of art painted in about half an hour for an iconic TV show has gone on sale for $10 million. The artwork, A Walk in the Woods, is the work of Bob Ross, the artist behind the long-running PBS show, The Joy of Painting. It was actually painted for the first ever episode of that series back in 1983. Wow. Ross was, of course, known for his unpretentious approach to painting, coining phrases such as happy little accidents to show there's no wrong way to create art. An art gallery in Minneapolis is selling the painting, the gallery owner says he doesn't expect a fast sale because of that high price tag. He sees it as a chance to display Ross's work to a larger audience. Smart idea to get people to that art gallery. Yeah. Just before the pandemic, there was actually a Bob Ross art display uh, in Virginia. I covered it. Huge turnout. People lined up to see his works. He, he, he just hits people in the heart because they have such fond memories of that show. Absolutely. My smart TV does this thing where it picks a random channel and then it stays on it for like a month. Right now, I'm on the Bob Ross channel, so go. every day I turn my TV on, I watch for a few minutes. It's very zen. Yeah. It is. It's so zen, and it's just so cool. Thanks, Joe. Yep. Well, there are new warnings from the UN this week about the global threat of climate change and the need for governments to act. Greece is at the center of concerns after the country saw a summer filled with unprecedented flooding and wildfires. NBC News Chief International Correspondent Keir Simmons witnessed firsthand the catastrophic impact of climate change. Ferocious wildfires, scorching heat waves and devastating storms. Southern Europe endured a summer of extreme weather. Take water. Greece was on the front line. So hot some days, the Acropolis was closed. Fires ripped through forests, while a Mediterranean hurricane unleashed the worst floods since records began. Greece's prime minister telling us climate change is a formidable challenge. It's a war we, we have to fight with, with an enemy we cannot sometimes we cannot uh, avoid, sometimes we can contain. We left Athens, travelling along the stunning coastline to a different Greece in the central region of Thessaly. Here, flood water left entire towns, villages and farms submerged after dams and rivers burst their banks. Residents stranded on rooftops without assistance, food or water, they say, for two days. 17 people were killed. Seven days after the storm hit, this is what we found in the town of Palamas. Homes destroyed. Here, the wall of a bedroom ripped off. Those with homes still standing, left with little else. We meet Georgia, weeping at what's left of her home. One of her few belongings saved, a wedding photo with her late husband. My daughter and grandson almost drowned, she says. We make it to neighboring Marathea, cut off for days. Just yesterday, this village was underwater and still now, every street looks like a river. 500 people lived here. Now, almost everyone has gone. This woman and her dog stayed. You've been trapped in, this, in the house all this time. You've stayed in the house all this time. They didn't want to leave. We didn't want to leave. Everywhere, cars are abandoned, houses are ruined. This is Soteris, this is his house. Is there anything left? Nothing, only the walls. There is anger here, not about the changing climate, but about the official response, or lack of it, they say. But they could uh, tell us to save our life uh, earlier. They could have given you a warning. Yes, we just woke up in the water. This local union boss has come with clean water and condemnation for the government. They don't care about the people. They only care about the big uh, multinationals. So you, you blame the government of more course. than climate change? Of course. Because climate change is global. We drove 400 miles to where a wildfire larger than New York City burnt out of control for over two weeks. Europe's largest ever recorded wildfire. Even within Greece, climate change is impacting different places in vastly different ways. Here in mountainous Evros, Charred tree trunks lined the roads for miles upon miles. 
Environmentalist Theodora Scarzi, who has spent her life protecting the rare birds of prey in this nature reserve, says dry conditions blamed on climate change were just one factor. She says many local people have left who used to look after the forest and fight fires. We haven't prepared for climate change. I, uh, for sure we are not prepared. <laughs> We've made it worse. While migrants pass through from Turkey, lighting fires that could have started a blaze. It's by accident, not by purpose. But because of the high number, that we cannot predict it, how many they are, uh, the, the risk is very high. 18 migrants died in the fires this summer. Volunteer firefighter Christos Sianaferis helped tackle the blaze, saving his livestock. These were your animals here. Yes. What was it like? Very bad. Yeah? Very bad uh, in the fire. Like so many, he blames officials. The authorities didn't listen to people who know the forest, he says. We predicted this four or five days earlier, he told me. Greece's leading climate scientist says governments need to adapt quickly. Their civil protection programs not adequate for the new global reality of extreme weather. It's biblical. Floods it and is. fires. It is. But without having Noah's Ark. What is Noah's Ark for yeah. you in Greece? Noah's Ark would be a preparation for such big disasters. Prevention, to prepare properly. To prepare properly. This summer, Greece and many Mediterranean countries suffering, and for governments everywhere, a warning of things to come. Such important reporting. Our thanks to Keir Simmons for that. Finally this hour, a massive change in the Golden State. Four dams are being removed from the Klamath River in California. Environmentalists hope the project will help restore habitats for wildlife in the area. NBC News correspondent Maura Barrett went to the river to see how it's being done. Hiding in the Cascade Mountain Range, what looks like a large-scale construction project is actually a team focused on demolition, removing decades-old dams along the Klamath River for the sake of the environment. One of the fastest ways to heal a river is to remove a dam. We went off-roading with the project leads. We want to get as much of the work done as possible in advance of the, the fish coming back. When you put a dam in the river, you know, it cuts off some really important processes that the rest of the river needs to be healthy. But the good news is when you have the opportunity to undam a river, the river can start to restore itself almost from the moment that the water starts flowing again. The four dams that will ultimately come down were built in the 1960s when infrastructure expansion outweighed environmental protection. Now, officials say they're aging out and the negative trickle-down impacts have taken full effect. It almost seems like it's a case of humans thinking they could outsmart Mother Nature. That's exactly what happens. We have to think about how technology has changed so that we can sometimes replace the service of a dam without having to have the dam itself. This is currently the largest dam removal and river restoration project in the world. When it's done, this reservoir will then be 400 miles of freely flowing river again, restoring and creating homes for species of fish and wildlife. The U.S. Army Corps of Engineers says 76% of American dams are considered to have, quote, high hazard potential. And research shows stagnant reservoirs become home to toxic algae in what's supposed to be a water supply source. We can see just looking down there how green the water is. And aging dams can put people in danger of catastrophic flooding as we see more extreme climate events. The surrounding native tribes have been fighting for these dam removals for over 20 years. It provides us with food, with spiritual well-being. It's, uh, it's our connection to the earth and to the land, and it's the lifeblood of the region. But the famous salmon of the Klamath have largely become extinct. We're suffering today because of those decisions that were made 100 years ago. This decommissioning project gets underway as an MIT study estimates 472 million people downstream from large dams suffer from reduced food security and regular flooding. It's really important to take a piece of infrastructure out when it doesn't work well anymore and poses a risk to the people who live around it. That's why we're seeing a new push towards rewilding, like the restoration of vulnerable wetlands in Louisiana and the reintroduction of bison to protect prairies in the Great Plains. A variety of ecosystems to restore imbalances in nature and protect future populations. Maura Barrett, NBC News, Klamath River, California. That's going to do it for this hour of Morning News Now. But the news continues right now.
Good morning and thank you for being here. I'm Savannah Sellers. And I'm Joe Fryer. Right now on Morning News Now, Capitol Hill chaos. The clock's ticking closer to a possible government shutdown. Now lawmakers are scrambling after House Republicans backed away from a previous deal. The upheaval even causing a split among the GOP. We're digging into what's at stake and the push to break the congressional logjam. <clears throat> Massive manhunt, a murder suspect walks free from jail. He didn't escape or post bail. He's on the run because authorities released him by mistake. My investigators waited nearly a week to notify the community. And what we've learned about one person taken into custody as deputies desperately try to track him down. End in sight after 142 days, the Hollywood writer's strike may soon be coming to a close. Both sides set to meet for negotiations today. The major change at the bargaining table and why some WGA members say they're skeptical. And forever young, as millions of Americans try to fight the aging process, we're getting new insight into the science behind living longer and healthier lives. And it centers on a little something called zombie cells. What you need to know about the spooky sounding cells and how they could be the key to everything from fighting cancer to maintaining a youthful look. Oh. Just in time for Halloween. Yeah. Zombie oh, cells. Sign us up. Yeah. Look forward to that story. Yeah. We're going to start this morning with, of course, Capitol Hill. House Speaker Kevin McCarthy facing an uphill battle this morning as he works to get a spending bill passed to avoid a government shutdown. Well, lawmakers have until September 30th to keep the government funded before money runs out just nine days from now. There's serious questions about whether Congress will be able to get the job done, though. NBC News senior Capitol Hill correspondent Garrett Hake has the latest. Hey, Savannah, Joe, good morning. The House Republicans met for more than two hours last night trying to come up with some kind of agreement just among themselves on a path to keep the government open. And now the speaker says they may have a plan, but the clock is ticking and the votes are not assured. This morning, chaos in Congress as the government lurches towards a possible shutdown amid a battle over spending with no clear end in sight. Nobody should be leaving town until we've sorted this out. The federal government runs out of money at the end of September. Without congressional action, it shuts down on October 1st for the first time since 2019. Look, it's not September 30th. The game is not over, so we continue to work through it. And uh, I've been at this place many times before, and we're going to solve this problem. Democrats and some Republicans have argued for a stopgap plan to buy more time to pass bills to fund the government through 2024. But House Republicans backing away from a deal struck with President Biden earlier this year are demanding steep spending cuts of roughly $300 billion, slashing budgets including education, nutrition and environmental programs. But this week they have struggled to pass anything at all. The stalemate frustrating even House Republicans. What do you say to people back home who may not follow this that closely, but just expect you guys to get this very basic function of your job done and fund the government? We're dysfunctional. It's just that simple. That simple. We are that we are so dysfunctional. A government shutdown would force hundreds of thousands of federal workers to be furloughed or to work without pay until the shutdown ends. National parks would be closed and government services like food safety inspections, passport applications and small business loans would be slowed. Democrats and President Biden hoping to lay the blame for any shutdown at the GOP's feet. They're back at it again, breaking their commitment, threatening, threatening more cuts and threatening to shut down the government again this month. The House plans to work a rare Saturday session to see if they can break this logjam. The Senate, meanwhile, has been handling its work on a bipartisan basis, but they stumbled late this week, too, meaning next week will be a very busy week on Capitol Hill. Savannah, Joe? All right, Garrett, thank you very much. Staying in Washington, Ukraine's President Volodymyr Zelensky scheduled to meet with President Biden and both houses of Congress today. He's hoping to lobby lawmakers and the president for more help in Ukraine's counteroffensive against Russia. However, he faces growing opposition among Republicans. NBC News senior White House correspondent Gabe Gutierrez joins us now with the latest. Gabe, good morning. So what exactly are Presidents Biden and Zelensky expected to talk about today? What is it Zelensky is asking for? Oh, hi there, Joe and Savannah. Good morning. Yeah, very busy day for Ukrainian President. And Zelensky here in Washington, as you mentioned, he'll be here not only at the White House later today, but also Capitol Hill. And for the first time, he will also meet with Defense Department leaders at the Pentagon. 
But uh, the Biden administration has been asking Congress for $24 billion in additional aid for Ukraine. There's a lot of skepticism, though, from many Republicans about extending that aid. Still, today, the White House is expected to announce a security aid to Ukraine that had previously been passed as part of another package. Uh, but there are still questions about what exactly that aid uh, will include. Uh, President Zelensky has been asking for these long-range guided missiles, and a senior administration official here says that no decision has been made on those missiles specifically, Joe and Savannah. So, Gabe, I mentioned just a second ago that he is, though, facing this opposition from some Republicans. I mean, last year when he visited, he was given this hero's welcome by both houses of Congress. This year, Speaker McCarthy says he has questions about accountability. Dive into that shift in tone for us. Yes, uh, President Zelensky was at the U.N. General Assembly this week trying to fight against that war fatigue, not just here in the United States, but really around the world. And just this morning, a new letter from Republicans to the White House is out, basically expressing skepticism about any more aid uh, to Ukraine. Just several days ago, House Speaker, Speaker Kevin McCarthy said that he had questions for President Zelensky about accountability and how exactly extra money will be spent. Again, the White House asking for $24 billion in additional funding from Congress. Unclear whether that might be passed. And this all comes into context, as we just heard Gary talk about, about that looming government shutdown and questions about finances and Republicans very skeptical about all of that. Jones yeah, so that. that's one reason Zelensky's plea takes on new urgency. Another one is that Poland and neighbors said it would no longer supply weapons to Ukraine. This is after a dispute over grain. Explain what's going on here. <laughs> yeah, that's right, Joe. A lot has changed since this war started about a year and a half ago, of course. Poland seen as a huge ally for Ukraine, but there has been a shift in tone in that country, partly because of upcoming parliamentary elections in uh, Poland. And there is a ban on grain exports from Ukraine. Uh, Poland was concerned that it's taken away from some of their farmers as well. And yeah, uh, the President Zelensky has faced backlash in Poland for by referring to this feud as, quote, political theater that is helping Moscow. So certainly, yes, with that ban on grain exports from Ukraine. Uh, Poland now saying that it will not uh, send uh, these weapons to uh, its neighbor at all playing out as this counteroffensive continues in Ukraine and President Zelensky trying desperately to lobby the international community for continued aid. Joan Savannah. All right. Gabe Gutierrez at the White House. Gabe, thank you. Well, turning now to Capitol Hill, where Attorney General Merrick Garland was confronted with tough questions from House Republicans over his investigations into both former President Donald Trump and Hunter Biden. NBC News Justice and Intelligence correspondent Ken Delanian has more. Facing intense political attacks, Attorney General Merrick Garland delivering a blunt message to Congress. His Justice Department is independent. I am not the president's lawyer. I will add, I am not Congress's prosecutor. The Justice Department works for the American people. Garland appointed the special counsel who indicted the president's son, Hunter Biden, last week on felony gun charges after a plea deal fell apart. Hunter Biden says he intends to plead not guilty. But Chairman Jim Jordan, who's leading an impeachment inquiry into the president, blasted Garland for not prosecuting felony tax charges related to income from Hunter Biden's overseas business dealings. What I'm wondering is why you guys let the statute of limitations lapse for those tax years that dealt with Burisma income. This investigation was being conducted by Mr. Weiss, an appointee of President Trump. You will, at the appropriate time, have the opportunity to ask Mr. Weiss that question. With former President Trump indicted by special counsel Jack Smith for attempting to overturn the 2020 election and mishandling classified documents, pleading not guilty in both cases, Republicans arguing the DOJ is engaged in prosecutorial overkill. The fix is in. Democrats defending Garland, saying the Republicans can't back up their claim. Facing hours of intense questioning, Garland flashing anger in response to a question about whether his department is targeting conservatives, including Catholics. The yes idea no. that someone with my family background would discriminate against any religion is so outrageous. Also refuting the charge by Mr. Trump that President Biden ordered his indictments. Biden indictments, excuse me. Biden, 
political indictments. He said to the he attorney said general. He said he's had nothing to do with it. He said to the attorney no general, indict him. No, no one has told me uh, to indict, and in this case, the decision to indict was made by the special counsel. Last evening, denied Hunter Biden's bid to plead not guilty over video link, saying he has to show up in person like any other defendant. Mr. Trump, meanwhile, has asked the judge in his election conspiracy case to recuse herself, arguing she is biased against him. Guys. All right. Kendall Anian, thank you very much. A massive manhunt is underway in Indiana. Authorities are searching for a murder suspect mistakenly released from jail earlier this week because of a clerical error. Now, police are asking the public for any information that can help get him back behind bars. NBC News correspondent Kathy Park is in Indiana with the latest on the search and the internal investigation into how this even happened. Kathy, good morning. Hey, Joe, good morning to you. The suspect, Kevin Mason, walked out of this jail behind me last Wednesday, and officials actually notified the public about his release nearly a week ago. And they say the extra time was really part of a strategy to locate him. But this morning, he is still on the loose. His girlfriend, however, is now in custody. This morning, an urgent manhunt in Indiana for a murder suspect authorities say was accidentally set free from jail. Our plan is to... Uh, look throughout the city with this uniform presence and make it uncomfortable for anybody who might be keeping him. The Marion County Sheriff's Office says 28-year-old Kevin Mason was mistakenly released last Wednesday, just two days after his arrest, due to faulty records review. So far, two inmate records clerks involved in this mistake have been terminated. This was an error. This should have not happened. Mason was wanted on three warrants in Minnesota, including a second-degree murder charge for his alleged role in a shooting in 2021, firearms possession, and a parole violation. And now deputies say they've arrested his girlfriend, Desiree Oliver, who they say picked him up after he walked out of jail. She then uh, went to obtain a new cell phone, which is kind of the deceptive type of behavior we'd expect somebody when they're assisting a criminal. Uh, later, she went to a Walmart up there on North Keystone, purchased some men's underwear, a travel kit, and some men's slippers. Local officials waited six days to inform the public about Mason's accidental release, a decision the sheriff's office stands by. We have used this time as a tactical advantage for us. Uh, we have used this time as uh, uh, the quietness of the situation to not uh, further run him underground. This latest search comes just days after the capture of Danilo Cavalcante, the convicted killer who was arrested following nearly two weeks on the run after escaping a Pennsylvania County jail. Back in Indiana, another community on edge with residents demanding answers. Someone made a big mistake. It upsets me that it puts the community in danger. And we should note that officials have been chasing leads overnight, and they do believe he has ties to Indianapolis, but it's still unclear if he's still in the area. Also, they are saying uh, to the suspect that he can still turn himself in and they can arrange for a safe surrender. Joe? All right, Kathy Park, thank you so much. Well, parts of the country are probably going to be seeing rain over the next few days. Meteorologist Angie Lastman is here with the bad news. <laughs> Maybe some good news somewhere. Maybe yeah, you know rain. what the good news is? I'm glad you bring that up, Joe, because we've got great conditions across the Northeast and really the Mid-Atlantic for, for today. It's going to be another gorgeous day. We had really nice conditions yesterday. It'll be very similar today, mild conditions. Uh, but yes, we're going to start to see a system forming just the Southeast coast. That means that places like Florida are going to be quite unsettled through the day today. And that is we get into the next couple of days, we'll see some of this rain and like in a better system start to work up into portions of the Carolina. So let's start there. We've got a low pressure that we're looking to develop here later into the afternoon hours. It may get some subtropical characteristics, but what it really means for folks is that they're going to need those indoor plans for uh, the weekend. Because as we look ahead to uh, today, all that rain still stays off offshore. But look what happens by tomorrow. Parts of the Carolinas are going to see a big push of moisture moving in. Some really impressive 
rainfall rates with this system as it brings on shore heavy rain stretching across parts of the mid-Atlantic and down towards uh, Charleston here for your day tomorrow. So heads up for folks in this area. We're also going to see those stronger winds. There will be rip current issue issues as well as um, some high surf. So not a great couple of days along the East Coast for beach going uh, and not great for outdoor activities either. Look what happens by the time we get into the weekend. The Northeast starts to get in on the action. We see parts of New England dealing with the soggy conditions. It's going to be a very annoying weekend when it comes to weather across this region. We're going to see plenty of shower activity, maybe some flooding concerns with really impressive rainfall happening over a period of a couple of days. It's also going to be those kind of windy conditions that we'll have to watch for. And again, the beach issues. When we're talking about rainfall amounts, the higher amounts are going to be closer to the coast, closer to where that system, uh, the center of it at least is. The higher amounts for parts of the mid-Atlantic localized maybe up to three inches. Look down towards the Carolinas, though. Cape Hatteras, you could see upwards of five inches in some spots. Those will be smaller pockets of heavier rain, but even still, that's why we're watching for the flooding concern over the next couple of days. This is just Friday into Sunday, so the next three days where all of that moisture starts to work on shore associated with that system. And the winds. This is going to be another thing that we'll have to watch for, potentially maybe some down trees, some down power lines, especially in those areas with super saturated grounds. We know it's not hard for some trees to fall. So just a heads up on that. You can always clear out some of those things from your backyard that might be might go flying if you see 40, 50 mile per hour winds in some spots. It looks like we'll be close to 50 mile per hour winds in some places like Ocean City, mid 40s for Norfolk. But either way, some gusty kind of annoying weather headed our way for that region. But look at this. How about this? Let's talk about nicer conditions across the Midwest where we're still getting that kind of last taste of summer, low 80s for Minneapolis. They've had quite a warm week. Uh, temperatures will remain above normal at least through today into tomorrow still across parts of the Great Lakes. Not quite as impressive as, as it was, but still running about 5 to maybe even 10 degrees above normal. Mid 80s for places like Lexington, low 80s for Indianapolis as we round out the work week. By the weekend, though, we finally start to settle into fall in a lot of these places, especially across parts of the Northeast. Yes, we'll have rain, so that's why you see temperatures like 66 degrees in Philadelphia on Saturday, but low 70s kind of settle in as that rain works out, uh, and we'll head back into our next work week in places like Philly into the mid-70s. So really kind of comfortable late September temperatures headed our way. Um, in the Midwest, we'll kind of hang out into those upper 70s in Chicago for the weekend. You'll have a little bit of nicer weather out there, but upper 70s for you, and then we get into those low 70s by Monday, gorgeous conditions uh, in Cincinnati with the low 80s to upper 70s. So guys, it really just depends on what you're looking for. If you're looking <laughs> yeah. for the indoor kind of chilly, annoying right. weather, the Northeast, We're the Mid-Atlantic. The Midwest, though, looks a little better. I feel like the leaves might be confused in the Midwest right now. Yes, uh, like that happens every year. Yeah, I know, exactly. yeah, up and down. All right, Andrew, thank you so much. No problem. There are major developments overnight in the Hollywood writers' strike. Word that a deal could be in the works and finalized as early as today. NBC News entertainment correspondent Chloe Malas has the details. Hey there, it's been 142 days since the Writers Guild of America went on strike. And yesterday, those formal negotiations started again after more than a month without any progress. Now we're hearing that we can expect some new updates today. Could there finally be an end to the months-long writer's strike that's ground Hollywood to a halt? Both sides meeting again today, and this morning, there's new hope for progress after major studio heads came to the table for the first time Wednesday, signaling a significant shift in the talks. A source close to the negotiations telling NBC News that talks on Wednesday were productive and that they're hoping for more progress on Thursday. But there's hope in the air for the first time in a long time. Late Wednesday, the Writers Guild of America, which represents more than 11,000 writers, issued a joint statement with the AMPTP, which represents streaming services and studios, including Comcast, the parent company of NBC Universal, saying simply that both sides met for bargaining and will meet again Thursday. But sources close to the negotiations tell CNBC that after Wednesday's meetings, writers and producers are near an agreement and hope to finalize a deal today. The source is also telling CNBC that if a deal is not reached, the strike could last through the end of the year. NBC News learning that top executives attended the negotiations for the first time, including Disney's Bob Iger, Netflix's Ted Sarandos, Discovery's David Zaslav, and NBC Universal's Donna Langley. Those talks are usually led by labor relations representatives and top AMPTP staffers. Um, so I'm really hoping that 
they're really coming in good faith. Online skepticism from some WGA members. One posting, I'll believe it when the WGA tells me they've reached a deal. The main sticking points between the two groups remain. Wage increases, residuals in the streaming era, and the use of artificial intelligence. This has been devastating as a WGA writer on strike. The effects felt by hundreds of thousands as Hollywood has been shut down, with actors also on strike in a separate dispute. Now, from the picket lines to A-listers, many urging both sides to move forward. I feel as if everybody understands that it's time to get on with it. But we're all in support of, uh, of uh, a decent and fair wage. Back to you. Chloe, thank you. Coming up for years, 401ks have been viewed as critical to a stable retirement. So why are many TikTokers speaking out against them? We're going to look at the fine print on this FinTalk trend. But first, we're getting new insight into the death of a New England Patriots fan at Gillette Stadium. What the first autopsy results show up next. Welcome back. We're learning more about what may have killed a New England Patriots fan who collapsed and died after a fight at a game this past weekend. NBC News Now anchor Tom Yamas has the new details. With new video and more eyewitnesses coming forward, investigators are trying to figure out how exactly a 53-year-old fan died shortly after being punched in the head at an NFL game on Sunday. 300 level, guy not breathing. The Norfolk County DA says preliminary autopsy results for Dale Mooney suggest there was no traumatic injury, but a medical issue was identified, not saying what that issue was. Mooney's official cause of death still remains undetermined pending further tests, and the DA's investigation remains ongoing. This, as we're seeing a new angle with this video obtained by our affiliate WJAR, taken before Mooney collapsed, appearing to show several Dolphins and Patriots fans scuffling. At one point, a man believed to be wearing a Dolphins jersey throwing a punch. Keith Noonan, sitting rows below, says he watched as paramedics tried saving Mooney. I saw paddles come out, um, so, you know, start to get worried. I turned to my son and I said, you know, let's just pray for the best. So far, no charges have been filed, and connecting the brawl to Mooney's death could be challenging. There was a death inside the stadium. We still don't know exactly why. Is there a chance for a lawsuit here? There certainly is a chance, but a plaintiff would have a steep burden here. They'd have to show that the stadium had noticed. They knew that this was a high likelihood and that they failed to take any security measures. The violent confrontation in Massachusetts, one of several happening during NFL games this week. The league did not respond when asked if they planned on changing any security or safety procedures at upcoming games. The NFL has previously said that one incident was too many. Loved ones are remembering Dale Mooney as a hardworking family man who leaves behind a wife and two sons. Our thanks to Tom Yamas for that report. The DA's office says it has examined multiple angles of the video capturing the scuffle prior to Mooney's collapse. But they're also asking anyone who has more video or witnessed the event to come forward. International headlines now. India has issued a travel advisory in Canada following the killing of a Sikh Canadian citizen. NBC News foreign correspondent Kelly Kobea joins us now. Hey, Kelly, good morning. Hey, Savannah and Joe. Yeah, the diplomatic war between India and Canada really heating up now with that travel warning and also India suspending visa services in Canada. India telling its citizens to remain vigilant and warning them of politically condoned hate crimes in Canada. It comes after the Canadian government accused India of possibly being behind the assassination of that Sikh separatist on Canadian soil. India has called the accusation absurd. Venezuela has sent 11,000 troops to take over one of its biggest prisons under the control of a powerful criminal gang for years. That prison, reportedly like a hotel with a pool, a nightclub, and a mini zoo. The Interior Ministry said on X, formerly Twitter, that it had become a center of conspiracy and crime and congratulated officers for regaining control. And hold on to your hat, guys. King Charles and Queen Camilla are in a blustery Paris on an official state visit. Their first stop, the Arc de Triomphe yesterday, where they were greeted by President Emmanuel Macron and his wife Brigitte. Then a state dinner at Versailles featuring blue lobster and French and British cheeses. 
King Charles addressed the French Senate just a short time ago, speaking mainly in French, and Queen Camilla tried her hand at ping pong with a French first lady. More still ahead on this trip, including Notre Dame and mm. Bordeaux's vineyards, guys. Oh, getting all the European feels nice? from that one, my goodness. Bordeaux vineyards. <laughs> all right, Kelly, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Coming up, a new development in the battle over AI, the action some popular authors are taking, and why they're saying they're being ripped off. But first, he's the GOP presidential hopeful whose controversial statements are generating a lot of buzz on the campaign trail. What Vivek Ramaswamy is saying about his style and surprising rise through the Republican ranks. Welcome back. This morning, we're getting new insight into the Republican presidential candidate who has been steadily rising in the polls. In a new CNN poll of New Hampshire voters, of course, an important state, Vivek Ramaswamy has moved into second place behind only former President Donald Trump. But unlike Trump, Ramaswamy has used TV and podcasts instead of social media to create a constant stream of content for his supporters. For more on this, we're joined by NBC News correspondent Dasha Burns in Ramaswamy's home state of Ohio. Dasha, you recently sat down with the presidential hopeful. He's made a name for himself for the style that has drawn comparisons to the presidential frontrunner, the former president, Donald Trump, a younger version. What did he tell you about his approach to politics and his penchant for controversy? Yeah, look, this is a guy who just a few months ago, most voters didn't know his name, let alone how to pronounce it. A lot of them still don't. And yet he is rising in the polls past some of these more experienced politicians with longer, stronger resumes. And at the last GOP debate, he really stole the spotlight. And with the next one coming up, uh, we sat down with him to talk about what it means that he has had this moment in the presidential uh, primary that nobody expected. Look, at the start of this race, uh, the expectation was that this was probably going to be more of a two-man race between former President Trump and Florida Governor Ron DeSantis. That is clearly not what's happening here. And in part, it's because Ramaswamy has really shaken up uh, this primary and both his style and his approach. It does. It is reminiscent of, of 2016. He is a businessman. He's a former CEO of a biotech company, another businessman, not a politician. Where have we heard that before? <laughs> and he's also been stirring controversy with some of his comments. I mean, just recently he's called uh, a black congresswoman a modern grand wizard of the modern KKK. He has suggested that federal agents played a role in the January 6th attack on the Capitol. Uh, and I asked him, you know, what do those sorts of comments, what, what is he trying to achieve with the controversial comments that he makes and just with his general uh, un untraditional approach to politics? Take a listen to what he told me. I think it is healthy for our country to have open, radically honest and candid conversations. You said at one point in one of your gaggles, and you're like, I, I just sometimes like say things off the cuff. Mm -hmm. I'm just honestly answering off the cuff. How much do you literally mean what you say? Because sometimes it feels like you just kind of like say things. None of us can have it always, right? You can't be radically candid and then also filter what you say when. And if I'm giving a serious speech about shutting down the administrative state, as we did recently. We intend to follow that through. In other cases, I also believe in moments of levity that are honest, that open up candid dialogue. I'm not saying things I don't mean, but that doesn't mean that that's a bedrock part of my policy agenda to drive forward either. Look, he's young. He has no experience in politics. And a lot of people didn't want to take him seriously at the start of this. But at this point, he is consistently polling in third place in national polls. And now with this CNN poll uh, second in New Hampshire, this is somebody that has really gained traction in this primary. Absolutely. Dash, I love the way you ask that. Sometimes it just seems like you just kind of say things because that's such a good way to put it. <laughs> um, Ramaswamy also generated some backlash with his plan to deport American-born children of undocumented immigrants. I know you spoke to him, though, about his own story, his own family's immigration story. Kind of revealed some new information here. Tell us about that. Yeah, well, because immigration has been such a big part of his platform, he has taken such hardline stances on, on two issues, Savannah, both immigration and he's taken a hardline stance on having 
uh, high school graduates, those 18 to 24, take a civics test in order to vote, similar to what, what he says his parents took in order to become citizens uh, of the United States. Uh, he, uh, we, we asked him, because he's been talking on the campaign trail about how his parents took the citizenship test, and recently he started talking more about his mother. So I asked him if his father uh, also took the citizenship test, and he said no. Uh, and we learned in this interview that his father is not a citizen of the United States and that his mother took the citizenship test and, and became a citizen after he was born, which means uh, Ramaswamy did gain citizenship through birthright. His parents, though, uh, he says, all came to the United States legally, which he says is, is the difference when he's talking about uh, deporting American-born children of undocumented immigrants, Savannah. All right, Dasha Burns, great interview, great reporting. Thank you so much for joining us on this. And now to a new battle brewing over artificial intelligence. A group of best-selling authors actually have filed a class action lawsuit against OpenAI. That's the maker of ChatGPT. They say OpenAI took their writings without permission and is using that data to illegally create AI versions of their copyrighted work. NBC News senior national correspondent Stephanie Gosk has the details. Hey there, this is an issue that people in so many different professions are worried about, and particularly the creative community. So many have raised concerns, including comedians, actors, and most recently, writers. That's because artificial intelligence relies on content that was originally created by people. And now some of the most famous authors in the world are suing, saying they're victims of what they call, quote, systematic theft on a mass scale. My books have been taken and I didn't even know about it. I wasn't asked about it. I didn't approve it. Best-selling author Michael Connolly, whose novels have been made into films like The Lincoln Lawyer and TV series Bosch, says he and thousands of other writers have been ripped off. There's no denying AI. It's going to be in our future. What is a structure that makes sense for, for authors? I think it's about consent. Our books were just fed into the big maw of AI. Now Connolly and dozens of other authors are suing OpenAI, the maker of ChatGPT, for mass copyright infringement, a legal action that could have implications for the broader pop culture. According to the suit, ChatGPT has already been used to create complete unauthorized versions of books by a number of authors, including George R. R. Martin, creator of the novels which Game of Thrones was based on, and who is also part of the lawsuit. It's just not fair. Why should I take a year to write a you know a 400-page novel if in 15 minutes it can be stolen and and redistributed? Other writers in the suit include John Grisham, author of legal thrillers like The Pelican Brief, and romance superstar Ellen Hildebrand, author of The Perfect Couple. AI systems rely on something called large language models. Those models are, quote, trained using massive amounts of text. OpenAI doesn't publicly say where it gets all of the material it has fed into the system. But according to the suit, at least some of it is copyrighted. The reason they can write so well is because they've ingested hundreds and thousands of books, and they've done this without permission, <laughs> without payment. In a statement to NBC News on the latest lawsuit, OpenAI says it is working with authors to discuss their concerns, writing, we respect the rights of writers and authors and believe they should benefit from AI technology. In response to a previous similar lawsuit, OpenAI argued the case be dismissed in part because courts have recognized that the use of copyrighted materials by innovators in transformative ways does not violate copyright. Connolly and the other writers say they don't buy it, arguing AI threatens not only novelists, but creative work of all kinds. I think it's just a threat to the, to the spark of creativity. I think there's something mystical and magical about it. And if you believe that, like I do, you also believe it could go away. Among other things, the plaintiffs in the lawsuits are asking for OpenAI to remove copyrighted works from its database unless the company licenses and compensates authors for their work. But the big question at this point, can the genie be put back in the bottle? Hmm. Back to you. Yeah, that's uh, a good question. Stephanie Goss, thank you so much. Coming up, taking legal action against Amazon. Yeah, there are new details in the FTC's complaint against Amazon for what it's calling deceptive prime sign-up and cancellation processes. And now Amazon executives have been named in the suit. More on that up next.
We're back with new details this morning on that Federal Trade Commission lawsuit against Amazon involving claims that the company duped millions of people into paying for prime service while also making it hard to uns unsubscribe. NBC News national correspondent Miguel Almaguer reports. The new unredacted details from the FTC's amended complaint against Amazon provide new insight into the alleged scheme to enroll customers unwittingly into the company's prime program. Taking the rare step of naming three top executives as defendants, the FTC singled out Neil Lindsay, Russell Grandinetti, and Jamil Ghani, saying they slowed, avoided, and even undid user experience changes they knew would reduce non-consensual signups because it would also hurt Amazon's profits. Lindsay explained that once customers become Prime members, even unknowingly, the suit says, they will see what a great program it is and remain members. So Amazon is OK with the situation. It's always significant when you know that people at the company in senior positions were aware of some of these issues. The FTC complaint claims Amazon made it purposely complicated for its 200 million plus Prime members to cancel their monthly subscription, which offers free shipping and other perks. According to the FTC, some Amazon employees urged the company to make changes, saying unknown recurring charges for families could mean money for groceries and gas. While NBC News was unable to reach the three executives in a stark rebuke, Amazon fired back, saying in part the FTC's decision to add three Amazon leaders to its civil case against the company is unwarranted. We've always made it clear and simple for customers to sign up for and cancel Prime. One of the nation's biggest companies accused of delivering more than just packages to their consumers. The updated lawsuit also comes as the FTC prepares to file a monopoly lawsuit against Amazon, which targets the company for a range of business practices the FTC calls anti competitive. Back to you. Miguel Almaguer, thank you. Now let's get you some other financial headlines. Amazon's Alexa is becoming more realistic Ooh, with a little help from AI. CNBC Silvana Hanau has that and other money news. Silvana, good morning. Hey, Joe. Hey, Savannah. Yeah, so Amazon is trying to bolster its standing in the tech industry's artificial intelligence race as it debuts 10 new devices with some new features. The tech giant introduced what it calls a smarter and more conversational version of its Alexa voice assistant Wednesday that is supposed to come with a more human sounding voice. Amazon says the audio assistant can now carry out a whole conversation without the need to keep saying Alexa before every interaction. The new devices will be available at the beginning of the year. The parent company of Budweiser says it will no longer cut off the tails of its iconic Clydesdale horses. Anheuser-Busch has been under pressure from PETA and other animal activist groups to stop the practice, which is known as tail docking. A company spokesperson says the brewer discontinued the tail docking earlier this year and that the safety of the prized horses is their top priority. PETA told CNBC it would celebrate the beer maker's decision by cracking open some cold ones. And it may sound like bad math, but at a recent auction, $10,000 sold for $480,000. And that's because it was a rare $10,000 bill from the Great Depression era that had never been circulated. The $10,000 bill used to be the highest denomination to circulate publicly, but all denominations higher than $500 were taken out of circulation in 1969 because of lack of use, guys. How cool is that? All right, Silvana, thank, thank you so much. Thanks, Silvana. Well, saving money can be a struggle, and now it has some people questioning the traditional ways of saving for retirement, taking to TikTok to criticize the 401k. NBC News correspondent Aaron Gilchrist spoke with creators and experts in an effort to separate the hype from a solid investment plan. 401ks have been a staple of retirement planning for decades, but now many TikTokers are turning on those savings plans. Most idiots out there, they go, oh, I have a 401k. Well, you've been sold a bill of goods, sweetheart. But experts urge consumers to slow down and really understand the potential realities of tossing them aside. A 401k was really created back in the 70s, gained popularity in the 80s as a replacement for pensions because those were not sustainable for companies. And that's really what it's there for is to kind of almost protect us against ourselves from spending that money now. 
All over FinTalk or Financial TikTok, videos show personalities from Tony Robbins to everyday creators denouncing the account's management fees. I want you to make an investment with me. Here's how it's going to work. If you make money, uh, and even if you don't make money, I get paid. Also in the crosshairs, age restrictions on taking out money. You can't touch it until you're 59 and a half without a penalty. And when you do take it out, the taxes. You have no idea how much they're going to take from you. Now, a growing cottage industry of creators is pushing life insurance policies as an alternative. Policies some of them can get commissions on if you sign up. Let me know any questions you have below. My team and I will help you with an alternative. Curtis Ray has more than a million followers on TikTok and owns a company that recommends both 401k style investments and insurance policies. He admits there are many problems in the TikTok life insurance industry, from multi-level marketing schemes to predatory salespeople on social media. But he insists some products are credible and can grow your money without stock market risks. The younger you are and the more time you give it, if you're educated and understand how insurance contracts work, they are designed for absolute best long-term benefits, in my opinion. Experts say you absolutely have to read the fine print on these insurance products as they function differently from standard retirement plans. It can become convoluted and potentially really expensive. Anytime someone says one of these phrases, you want to beware. If they're using phrases including leverage, borrow against, or tax-free, those are red flags. Are there any redeeming qualities to these sorts of uh, policies as a form of some degree of investment? If we're talking about variable life insurance or whole life insurance, no. I have never yet seen one good example. And while financial author Ramit Sethi favors traditional retirement investing because of the popular employer matches and pre-tax savings, he says the 401k isn't perfect. Oftentimes, these 401k funds have these bloated investment options with slightly higher fees than I personally would like. Bottom line, with TikTok becoming a key driver of financial advice for so many Americans, whatever you choose, do the homework on your individual personal financial reality. I would say to anyone who's buying any financial product, to be able to then turn around and explain it to somebody else. And if you can succinctly do that, you understand it. All right, there you go. Some good information there. Thanks to Aaron Gilchrist for that reporting. Well, coming up, the key to living a longer, healthier life might be in your cells. When we come back, the new research that's focusing on a new method of slowing the aging process. Welcome back. The 2024 election is coming, and one singer wants to make sure her fans are ready for it. Taylor Swift took to Instagram to urge her followers to visit voter registration website vote.org to make sure they can have their say next year. She wrote, I've heard you raise your voices and know how powerful they are. She was referring to her concerts. According to the site's communication director, the site was averaging 13,000 users every 30 minutes, which is a record-breaking number. Visitors to the site can check if they are registered in less than 30 seconds. And Joe, I just think it's no coincidence, 13,000 every 30 oh, seconds. Oh, wow. Planned. It's like she planned it, right? It's just... <laughs> Very cool. Thanks, Savannah. Yes. Now to some research at the forefront of a favorite or perhaps least favorite topic for many of us, aging. NBC News correspondent Jacob Sobroff shows us what it takes to get rid of what researchers are calling zombie cells so we can live longer, healthier lives. Hey there, I went to the Mayo Clinic's Kogod Center for Aging in Rochester, Minnesota, where they're doing extraordinary experiments focusing on the science of aging. And what they're really looking at is cells, certain ones that we all have, that basically control the aging process and how fast it goes. They're called, wait for it, zombie cells. Either it's a one of three dilution. This is what it looks like studying what might be the key to living healthier longer. Dr. Nathan Labrasur and his team at the Mayo Clinic have honed in on one of the most important aspects of aging, zombie cells. Zombie cells. Sounds kind of freaky. It does sound freaky. So these are cells that have experienced a lot of damage, and they're so damaged that they don't work properly anymore, and they wreak havoc on surrounding cells and tissues, but they're not so damaged that they die. So they have this reputation of being zombie cells because they look dead. Zombie cells are known in the medical field as senescent cells. When we're young, they can be helpful against the spread of cancer. But as we age, the more zombie cells you have that have been compromised, meaning they're older, they're weaker, and they're damaged, the worse your health could be. Research is being done to see if there are ways to kill off these cells or even change them. 
which in a way would stop or slow the aging process. As we age, these cells are not effectively cleared from the system, and as they accumulate, that's when they really cause damage and harm. Mayo Clinic researchers are learning a lot in the lab, using mice of the same age to compare those with a lot of zombie cells and those with fewer zombie cells. The difference is dramatic. This one hasn't had any medical intervention. This one has, they're the exact same age. That's right, so really kind of a mix of kind of age-related conditions that we see in humans with changes in the eyes, changes in the posture, changes in the muscle, and, and, and reductions in function, physical activity. Dr. Labrasseur says physical activity and healthy living are crucial to naturally ridding ourselves of these damaging zombie cells. What's the best way to avoid having a buildup of them in the first place? Yeah, I'm not going to surprise you. It's the fundamentals of healthy aging. Exercise. Exercise is number one. <laughs> I'm a bit of an exercise evangelist. But in addition to that, healthy eating behaviors, um, sleep, other things are really critical to optimizing the biology of aging. That's because healthy habits can prevent zombie cells from occurring. And the research has now advanced enough to bring actual humans into the mix. The team's currently studying senior citizens, tracking their cells and health. Susan Mackert is 73 years young. Has participating in the study made you think differently about aging compared to when you started? It, it has in a way. What it has done is made me realize that I am aging. I, I, I don't think about that normally, but it, yes, it, it has put me in that generation with others that now can say, oh, we're aging. We're all aging. And that's okay. We're all aging. Aside from human studies, one of the latest developments in aging research is on skin. Here, Dr. Saranya Wiles is measuring the moisture of my skin to show that older skin heals more slowly than younger skin. But wait until you see what kind of sci-fi stuff she's doing. This is where we print the skin. Oh my gosh, so now I'm looking at it and actually realizing what I'm holding. So when you say those are skin cells, is, is that actually skin? That is skin. So that's skin growing in my hand. Correct. First of all, this is entirely freaky and totally crazy, but also awesome. What are you looking for exactly? We're looking for changes that are histologically seen. We can actually model different ages of skin based on the zombie cells. So if we were to put 10% zombie cells versus 25% zombie cells, this is to, then we can mimic a 30-year-old skin versus a 50-year-old skin. Dr. Labrasur says all the research they're doing isn't to create a fountain of youth, but to keep us healthier until the very end, no matter how long you live. Our goal is not to help people live until they're 120 and feel like they're 120. The goal of aging research is really to extend human health span. 80% of our medical resources are given to 20% of the population. If we could extend human health span and really delay age-related diseases as a group, that would transform society. Yeah, I'm sorry to report that this is not a, uh, a fountain of youth, but Dr. Labrasur says if they can get to the bottom of solving the conundrum with these zombie cells, we might be able to look at diseases like cardiovascular disease, Alzheimer's and more, and potentially live very healthy lives longer and only limit these types of diseases to the very end uh, of life. The research they're doing there is really extraordinary. It was awesome uh, to go and see. Back to you. All right, Jacob, thank you. And we're going to end this hour with a dazzling display. The spectacle known as the Northern Lights lit up the sky Monday night. In case you missed it, NBC News correspondent Harry Smith has an encore. While you were sleeping Monday night, sky watchers got quite the show. A full-color blitz of the Aurora Borealis. These shots are from Montana. This time-lapse from a balcony in Canada. So cool. When charged particles from a solar storm reach the Earth's atmosphere, the atmosphere gets excited, so to speak. And we do, too. You're in the mountains. It's dark. There's nobody around. And... Yeah, I get all excited um, when, when those photos start coming in. When Virginia landscape photographer Peter Forrester got word of the flaring sun, he headed to the Shenandoah Forest. It feels like just experiencing a, a, a new side of nature that's just the most spectacular it can be. The sky literally fills with color and light. Um, and and that, that's kind of hard to compare to anything else. And you end up with views like this from Minnesota, makes you wish you were there to see for yourself. Harry Smith, NBC News, New York. That Doesn't was the next best thing. Yeah. <laughs> I do want to see them, though. Exactly. I know. This is for this hour of morning news now. The news continues right now. 
Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.